Okay, welcome to Pediatric Tuberculosis, today's webinar. This is Kelly Musoke, and I'm the Director of Education at the Curry Center. This webinar is produced by the Curry International Tuberculosis Center, located in Oakland, California. I've also marked Dr. Loeffler's location in Oregon on the map. The Curry Center is one of five regional tuberculosis training and medical consultation centers in the country. The Curry Center currently covers jurisdictions in the western region that include Washington State, Oregon, Idaho, California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Alaska, Hawaii, and the U.S. Pacific Island Territories. This project was funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Cooperative Agreement and is a project of the University of California, San Francisco. Today's faculty member has signed a Declaration of Disclosure. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann Loeffler. Dr. Loeffler has been the pediatric tuberculosis consultant for the Curry Center for more than 15 years. She considers herself responsible for pediatric TB in the 10 western states and the Pacific Islands and is very pleased when you share your cases and questions through the Curry Center's warm line. In addition to being a TB clinician, she is a hospitalist and infectious diseases attending at Randall Children's Hospital, Legacy Emanuel in Portland, Oregon. Her other roles include Medical Director for Outreach Education, Chair of the Peer Review and Quality Committee, Physician Advisor for Care Management, and Runaround Soccer Mom. Dr. Loeffler? Good morning. Thank you, Kelly. This morning, we're going to spend about an hour talking about some of the essentials of pediatric tuberculosis. Needless to say, I can't cover all of tuberculosis in one hour, so we are definitely going to concentrate on a few elements. And before we talk about what the agenda is today, I'd like to reiterate that I have no disclosures. And unfortunately, these adorable children are not mine. These are Kelly's boys. They are so darn cute. So kind of let you know what we'll be talking about today. We are going to concentrate on two big elements. We're going to talk about what are some of the features that distinguish pediatric tuberculosis from adult tuberculosis, both in the way they're diagnosed, in the fact that the children are not very infectious, the treatment differences, and then switch gears a little bit to talk about how to get kids to take their medicine, how we monitor kids differently, which um, is fortunately a little more streamlined than in adults, and then some of the challenges of working with both the kids and their parents. So. There are a lot more adults than kids in the world, so why are you spending this hour and why do kids get their own talk? Well, they are so darn cute, as you already saw from Kelly's kids. But these two kids on this slide um, are this, oh, that green arrow looks funny. This little girl is uh, a patient of mine who was diagnosed with multidrug resistant tuberculosis after her parents adopted her from Ethiopia, and we evaluated her here in Portland. You'll be glad to know she is absolutely thriving and doing fabulously. And this is a um, picture of my own son who was uh, featured in a video that we made on gastric aspirate. So um, I'll show you another slide of him later. I just wanted to make sure you know that he is also thriving. And I think you can all agree with me that these kids are adorable. Well, is that not enough for you? OK, why else do kids deserve their own talks? Well, if you think about tuberculosis in the world if in an endemic area, maybe 1% to 2% of people at the most would be infected every year with tuberculosis. So a young child has a relatively low risk of overall exposure. But given that low risk of exposure, they have a higher risk of TB disease in the preschool years. So 40% of babies who are infected with tuberculosis germ will develop disease. That's an inordinately high rate. And if you think about it and compare it to the other enormously high rate, which is that of HIV-infected individuals with an incomplete or immunocompromised state, those individuals have a 5 to 10% lifetime risk excuse me, 5 to 10% yearly risk, but these babies have a 40% risk in that first year of life. And as the kids get a little bit older, the risk goes down a bit, but still when you're a toddler, you still have about a 25% risk of developing TB disease if you're infected. So kids are important and deserve extra evaluation. In addition to higher rates of disease, they also have higher rates of dissemination. So among those babies less than one year of age with TB disease, 8.2% have meningeal disease, so that means the 
bacteria affects the lining cells of their brain and their spinal cord, and almost 5% have miliary disease, which is a bacteremic form of this infection. And additionally, let's say you only take care of adults. You don't even interface with kids. Well, pediatric TB is still important because a new diagnosis of latent TB infection or TB disease in a young child reflects recent transmission. It means that some adult or adolescent in your community has recently been coughing, singing, laughing, sneezing, TB germs into the air to be breathed in by this cute little child. And therefore, this diagnosis of recent transmission is a public health opportunity, or what we call a sentinel event. So here is a random x-ray that I put in to uh, distinguish transitions in my talk. You'll see here, this is a kind of a typical pediatric TB x-ray in that, in that um, they have swollen lymph nodes, which you can see on the right side of your image and perhaps some parenchymal haziness. This is an old x-ray, but is pretty typical. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about then was um, how children come to be diagnosed with tuberculosis. And again, this is to be distinguished from adults. So it turns out that only about 50 kids, excuse me, 50% of kids in the United States are diagnosed with TB disease because they either have symptoms of TB, which brought them to medical attention, or they have an abnormal chest radiograph. Only about half of kids. How does that um, differ from adults? Well, if you look at all cases of TB as a whole, which is predominantly adults, you find that 80% of TB cases come to attention because they either had symptoms, which a clinician came to be concerned was caused by TB, or their x-ray was abnormal and thought to be concerning for tuberculosis. So that's a big difference. Again, 50% of kids um, only are symptomatic. And then the next reason that a lot of kids are identified with tuberculosis disease is during a contact investigation. So a contact investigation means that some adult or adolescent with TB disease who has potentially contagious has their contacts or their household members, their family members, their daycare members screened for possibility of infection or disease with tuberculosis. And this is a huge number of children identified with TB disease this way. 43% of U.S. kids diagnosed with TB are identified because they have a contact with TB disease. And this is in comparison to only 4.6% of all TB cases in general. Now, not an inconsequential number. 444 adults were diagnosed um, per year with TB disease during contact investigation. So it's still worth doing. But if you're in a situation where you work on contact investigations, I think this statistic of almost tenfold more kids being diagnosed gives you impetus to be really aggressive in screening those little kids. And then finally is the category of universal or targeted screening. So this is the phenomenon of uh, evaluating people who are asymptomatic and screening them because they perhaps have TB exposure risks or TB disease risks. And it turns out that just a few percent of both adults and children every year are diagnosed in this way. So not a very high yield activity. And just a few words about general screening. About 15 years ago in the United States, we published guidelines um, calling for targeted testing for latent TB infection instead of any process of universal screening or standard screening. So now it turns out that very few children require routine tuberculin skin tests or IGRAs, or interferon gamma release assays. So both for adults and for children, we now recommend what we call targeted testing. So we look at the individual's risk factors before we put on a skin test. And this is usually done during routine healthcare and by using a questionnaire which targets risks. So there's a big difference between the way we screen children and the way we screen adults. So we think about evaluating children who are likely to be infected with the tuberculosis germ. And the reason that we look for all forms of tuberculosis infection is because kids tend to tolerate the treatment for a latent TB infection much better than adults do. So it's worth evaluating them, testing them, screening them, and treating them. And 
Additionally, they have their whole life to reactivate TB if they have latent TB infection. And so if we can target this group of patients who would benefit from treatment and tolerate treatment, we can reduce the pool of infected individuals. This is a distinction from adults. Adults do not tolerate the treatment quite as well. I mean, still isoniazid is, is well tolerated, but an increased risk of hepatotoxicity for adults compared to children. And if you have been infected more than two years with the mycobacterium tuberculosis germ, you have a really pretty low rate of reactivation unless you develop a risk factor for disease. And so the strategy of testing adults for targeted screening for latent TB infection is uh, the process of evaluating their risk factors for TB disease. So were they recently infected? Do they have a known contact? Do they have some immunocompromising condition like cancer, HIV, steroid use, renal disease, um, significant malnutrition? So this, again, this is a big distinction. We want to treat all children who we find have LTBI. And very importantly, do not test individuals who you would not treat if they are positive. And that's true for adults and children. This uh, next slide shows um, an interesting feature of TB disease and how children are diagnosed with TB disease in the United States. For individuals as a whole, about 80% of individuals who are diagnosed with TB disease in the United States have a positive culture confirming that they have mycobacterium tuberculosis disease. And this slide shows about the last 20 years of pediatric TB cases, and it shows that only about 25% of children in the United States, and that's defined as children 0 to 15 years of age, have a laboratory confirmation, so they have a positive culture. The, about half of kids are diagnosed with what we call clinical disease, and that means that they um, were con had a concerning feature for mycobacterium tuberculosis disease. Their clinician may or may not have collected cultures. They were started on TB treatment, and they had either clinical or radiographic improvement coincident with starting TB treatment. That's what's considered a clinical case. And about 20, another quarter of kids or so have what we call provider diagnosis. And that means that they didn't have a positive culture. Uh, and I need to tell you that only about half of kids in the United States even have cultures collected when people are considering TB disease. It's not easy to collect these cultures. And so um, many times it doesn't happen. And um, in the case of provider diagnosis, it means that the child did not even have a compelling clinical or radiographic improvement on TB treatment. But the provider still thought that they had TB disease, and so this is what we call um, provider diagnosis. This slide shows um, a breakdown of age group. And what you can see here in the uh, upper left is for age less than one year of age. A half of those babies are diagnosed because they have a positive culture. So little babies have very high yields of the specimen that I like to collect most, which is the gastric aspirate. And about um, a quarter each of the young children will have the clinical case versus the provider case. You see that in the toddler years and the uh, school age years, relatively fewer children have laboratory confirmation. And um, I think this is because both fewer children have gastric aspirates collected, and they have a lower yield. When you get to the older school-age kids, age uh, 10 to 14, you see that the laboratory confirmation rate goes up again. And I think this is in large part because these children, when taught properly and coached and perhaps have induction, can collect sputum. And those specimens have a good yield. So, this is another x-ray. This uh, x-ray came from Dr. Brian Lee and Oakland Children's. And this is a um, child who was diagnosed with TB disease. He had both some lymph node disease and some parenchymal disease. And you see this big black area in the lower part of his left lung. And in, since you really can't see it that well, you don't know whether this is pneumothorax or a different problem. But the original film shows that there still are lung markings in that black area. And so this is not um, a pneumothorax. What is happening here is that lymph nodes are compressing 
the airway in this left lower lobe. And what is happening is that for a time period, as the lymph nodes were swelling, the air could get past the relative obstruction, but the air could not get out. So this is what we call the ball valve phenomenon and can lead to this huge area of hyperexpansion. And the treatment for this, if you are confident that you're dealing with TB disease and you're confident that the child has um, a susceptible disease or disease for which you're covering properly, you can use uh, steroids such as um, prednisolone, solumedrol, dexamethasone in order to shrink the lymph node tissue. So this is an uncommon um, complication of tuberculosis disease, but um, a dramatic x-ray. So I thought I would show it to you. All right, again, changing gears here for a minute. We're going to talk about um, TB diagnosis. How do we come to diagnose TB? And as a distinction, I thought I would include a slide about how we diagnose adults with tuberculosis. I don't take care of adults anymore, but once upon a time, I worked in some of the TB clinics in the Bay Area, and I took care of adults. And so I think I know how this works. I think that most adults are diagnosed with tuberculosis because they have suspicious symptoms or radiographic changes. And we like to collect very high quality specimens. We like to collect at least three sputa specimens induced if possible. At least one should be first thing in the morning. And we process those specimens. And of course, if it's the sputum is smear positive for AFB, it means there's a relatively high number of organisms in the in the sputum, or we could do a nucleic acid amplification test, and if that's positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis, well, that would be a good reason to go ahead and start treatment after collection of sputum. Another reason we might start um, treatment after the collection, even if maybe the smear is negative or the NAT is not positive, would be if you have a, a, a good, strong, suspicious exposure history or demographics. So perhaps you, the patient has a known exposure to a recent case or comes from an area of the world where there's very high rates of tuberculosis. In that case, you might start TB treatment. Another reason you might start treatment right away before culture results are available and if the smear is negative, if you have a classic radiographic finding or symptom. So for example, if you have cavitary disease and it's not typical of a different cavitating pneumonia, or if the symptoms are typical like a chronic cough, hemoptysis, weight loss, etc. And then finally, in adults, another reason we sometimes start treatment before culture results are positive, even if the smear is negative, is if it, the individual has exposure to very high risk contact. So um, I've been in a situation where a school teacher or someone with young children in the house, the radiograph was not completely classic, the smear was negative, but we went ahead and started treatment on that individual to protect the contacts. And then in the case of adults, we can reevaluate. We can reevaluate based on the culture results and based on the response to treatment and other information about what else might be going on with the adult. So for the many of you listening to this who take care of adults, I hope, hope I've captured that well. And now I want to distinguish it from children. So remember when I told you about 43% of children are actually diagnosed in the United States with tuberculosis during contact investigation? Uh, well, now I want to talk to you a, bit, a little bit about how that looks. So when you have a young child who is exposed to a potentially contagious adolescent or adult, during a contact investigation, the first thing you're going to do is put on a tuberculin skin test or perform an IGRA test if the patient has not had a positive in the past. And immediately, coincident with doing those things, you want to do a history and physical exam to see what kind of symptoms they might have to suspect to, excuse me, to suggest that they already have tuberculosis disease and do a physical exam to look for evidence mostly of extrapulmonary TB because your chest radiograph will tell you pretty much about pulmonary and intrathoracic TB. So you're going to look for evidence that they have meningitis or disseminated disease or um, scrofula, some of those common manifestations of TB disease that happen early in the infection. And then immediately you're going to do a chest radiograph I prefer a two-view chest radiograph, and national guidelines ask for two views for sure in kids less than five years of age. And who deserves a chest radiograph? Well, certainly the children less than five years of age, even before their skin test returns, because they have the highest rate of progression to TB disease. Or a child who's immunocompromised, for example, if they have cancer, on chronic steroids, HIV, and that's true for adults as well. 
if the individual has signs or symptoms of TB disease, so perhaps they've been having a, a cough that's been lingering, weight loss, uh, poor appetite, sort of unexplained fevers, those would all be good reasons to obtain a chest radiograph in any individual who is exposed to TB disease, or of course any person who has a positive skin test or IGRA during this contact investigation. So who deserves immediate treatment for TB disease? among these children being evaluated during the contact investigation? Well, of course, if they have an abnormal chest radiograph, that's typical for TB disease. So typical for TB disease in children would include intrathoracic lymph node enlargement, parenchymal disease, evidence of miliary tuberculosis. Those are the big things that make me think of TB disease versus other things. And you want to start that treatment even if the child is asymptomatic because we saw before that only 50% of kids in the United States come to medical attention because of symptoms or abnormal chest radiograph. And you want to do that even if the skin test or the IGRA is negative because easily 25% of kids in the United States when they're initially diagnosed with TB disease have a negative skin test or IGRA. And ideally, you will collect cultures before you do that, either sputum, induced sputum, or gastric aspirate. So I briefly mentioned what are some of the common radiographic findings in TB disease in children. And this slide reminds me to tell you what are some of the things that uh, people tell me about or uh, radiographic findings that I see that do not indicate TB disease. So the first thing is isolated calcified granulomata. So you see little white specks on the x-ray that are fairly bright and small and are not surrounded by parenchymal changes and not, um, uh, excuse me, not surrounded by an enlarged lymph node, that is not considered TB disease. And something that can look kind of like calcified granulomata are pulmonary blood vessels on end. So the blood vessels, of course, are 3D structures. And when a blood vessel comes out from the heart and then turns toward you, it can look like a little bright white circle. It can look like a calcified granulomata. But the, um, the way to distinguish it is that if you look at the other blood vessels adjacent to that white spot, they have exactly the same diameter. And these white spots are concentrated close to the heart. The smaller blood vessels out in the periphery don't tend to have that um, appearance. So sometimes we um, hear about x-rays where people were concerned about a lot of granulomata and and by a lot, I mean maybe a half a dozen, and they turn out to be pulmonary vessels on end. Of course, that's not tuberculosis disease. Another thing that is not tuberculosis disease are isolated calcified lymph nodes if they are not enlarged. And I'll show you a picture in just one minute. If a child has calcified lymph nodes and the lymph node is no longer enlarged, it represents an involuted scarring and does not deserve treatment for TB disease. Both adults and rarely children can have isolated pleural thickening without any parenchymal changes, without any symptoms. That's not considered to be TB disease. In the context of a positive skin test or IGRA, that's considered to be latent TB infection. When your radiologist describes peribronchial thickening or cuffing, that indicates a viral process or reactive airways disease. And without any other features to suggest TB disease, that's also not considered TB disease. And then finally, when a radiologist reports that a child has hilar fullness, that means that they're not 100% confident whether that child has enlarged lymph nodes in the intrathoracic space or if that, in fact, indicates plump and healthy pulmonary blood vessels, which is very, very common in children. And this is why we always like to obtain the lateral view, um, really on all children, but ideally uh, up in all children less than five years of age if you're finances restrict your ability to do two-view chest radiographs on all children. Because a lymph node is also a 3D structure, and except for paratracheal lymph nodes, lymph nodes should be able to be seen on lateral, a hilar, mediastinal, subcrinal lymph nodes. You can see them on the frontal view, and you can confirm that that's a lymph node when you see it on a lateral view, because it's a spherical structure. So when you hear hilar fullness, you should be a little suspicious and think about the possibility that this is not TB disease. So this is an x-ray that shows some calcifications near that blue arrow. Um, 
which are not associated with a parenchymal or lung tissue disease and are not associated with enlargement of lymph nodes. So this is considered to be latent TB infection and not TB disease. Here's another picture of some enlarged lymph nodes to distinguish it from those other lymph nodes. And again, if I showed you a lateral, you should see some uh, lumpy, bumpy, potato-like structures, these white, massy-looking things on the lateral um, in the mediastinum or the hilum or the infrahylar window. Those are indicative of lymph nodes, and we treat those as TB disease. Even if they're not associated with symptoms, even if they're not associated with parenchymal changes, in the United States and the whole Western world, including South Africa, where they treat a ton of pediatric tuberculosis, isolated intrathoracic lymphadenopathy is treated as TB disease because if you do not treat it with multidrug treatment, up to 10% of the time, your treatment will fail. And in the United States, we consider that an uh, unacceptable rate of success. So we treat with multidrug regimen just as we do for other TB disease. This x-ray shows a paratracheal lymph node. That lump, which is um, emphasized by the big blue arrow, indicates a per, uh, paratracheal lymph node. And sometimes it's not this obvious. Sometimes you have to look at the airway. So this is the trachea coming down here to bifurcate into the bronchi. And a normal position of a trachea on a beautifully centered film will be actually a little to the right of the midline because the aorta is over here, and this kind of just, just slightly pushes the airway over in a nice normal radiograph. In this case, you can see that this airway is just a little bit to the left of the midline, and that indicates that this paratracheal node is just putting a little bit of pressure on the airway and deviating it ever so slightly. So this is a good way to look for a paratracheal lymph node. So I talked to you a little bit about how to evaluate a child during a contact investigation for TB disease, and now I want to talk about a very common scenario, which is child is uh, found to have a positive tuberculin skin test, and that could also include a, a child who's found to have a positive IGRA, and this could be because you did targeted testing and found that they had risk factors um, or had some radiographic concerns and someone said could be tuberculosis, let's, let's put a skin test on. So if you get a positive tuberculin skin test or a positive IGRA, of course you're going to do the things we talked about in the contact investigation. You're going to take a history and physical, you're going to take a chest radiograph, ideally a two-view chest radiograph, and then you're going to evaluate those things. If those things are completely normal, positive skin test but normal exam and normal radiograph, we call that latent TB infection and we treat for latent TB infection, which is usually isoniazid for 270 doses or nine months if the child takes the medicine every single day. But sometimes it's more complicated. Sometimes you have an abnormal radiograph or some clinical features, and then the hard part begins. Now you have to decide whether the child has uh, radiographic or clinical features that are classic for tuberculosis or are more consistent with another diagnosis. And this is very important because in the United States, the vast majority of kids who have a positive tuberculin skin test are not going to have TB disease, even if they have some radiographic changes. So kids who have asthma, kids who have community-acquired pneumonia, um, kids who have any number of other processes can have an abnormal chest radiograph, even with a positive skin test. And we do not want to treat a lot of children for TB disease who do not need it. Sometimes we overtreat a little bit, especially in the highest risk patients, but in general, we want to avoid overtreatment. It is, it is a big burden on families, on healthcare systems, on public health, so we want, to, we want to get this right if we possibly can. So this is what I like to do. I like to look at those radiographs, I like to look at the patient, and if the situation suggests that it's more consistent with diagnosis and if the child is very stable. So I've certainly had situations where a patient was clinically unstable in the hospital, even in the ICU. After I've collected my specimens, I treat for TB disease. So that's over here. If, if either the findings on the chest radiograph or the history are very classic for TB. So again, those would be the kids with intrathoracic lymphadenopathy or typical features of TB. Collect culture, start TB treatment. Patient unstable, collect culture, start TB treatment. Now, let's go back to this side of the table. What if the child is very stable, 
the radiographic findings were more typical for another disease. Well, you could consider culture collection, especially, say, the older kid who can give you sputum. Maybe you have a mechanism to do sputum induction. That is ideal. Um, it's nice to be able to collect cultures, do a smear, perhaps a NAT test, and um, have culture results pending. Remember, until you have ruled out TB disease, either in an adult or a child, do not start isonized for a latent TB infection. And I know that's sometimes difficult. Sometimes you're sitting on your hands. Sometimes you're nervous that their disease is going to progress. But I promise you, you will not do them any favors by starting isonized monotherapy if they have TB disease and you have not um, clarified it. But what you would like to do is treat other diagnoses that are possible. So if the child has some elements of reactive airways disease, you could use albuterol. Ideally, you would not start steroids because um, that could mask TB disease temporarily until the immune system is really suppressed, and then you could make matters worse. Um, sometimes you use amoxicillin to treat community-acquired pneumonia. And then you want to follow the child very closely. This is, this is only a good strategy if the child will not be lost to follow-up. What I like to do is reassess the child weekly. You don't necessarily need to see them every week, but you at least need to be in touch with them or have your public health department colleagues be in touch with the family and make sure they're not clinically worsening. And then after a few weeks, what I like to do is repeat the chest radiograph. If the chest radiograph has completely normalized or their clinical findings have normalized, then they're considered to have not, not have TB disease. Again, positive skin test, normal chest radiograph, that's latent TB infection. So then we come around to this side again, and we treat for latent TB infection. So I know this is a bit of a busy slide, but the thing I really want to emphasize is that most children in the United States do not have TB disease, even if they have a positive skin test, even if they have a modestly abnormal x-ray. All right, changing subjects again, contagion. Of course, um, adults who have pulmonary or laryngeal TB are contagious until proven otherwise. We know that the risk of sharing that germ increases if they have cavitary TB, if they have smear positive sputum, if they have lots of cough, or sometimes there's the specific microorganism has some factors which seem to be associated with transmission. But the big rule is that young children are not contagious with tuberculosis. So I said it's a rule, which means that rules are meant to be broken. There have been rare newborns, especially a couple children with congenital tuberculosis who have transmitted to healthcare workers and to other individuals. And of course, when you get to be an older child and you have extensive parenchymal disease, cavitary disease, lots of cough, you could be at risk for transmitting the organ. Kelly, I suspect that means that my headset is tight. Oh, you got your audio going in and out. To reiterate, um, some older children with tuberculosis disease certainly can be contagious, especially those who have parenchymal disease, cavitary disease, or especially with lots of cough. I myself have seen a child as young as eight who had spontaneously induced four-plus smear positive sputum. And there's a highly publicized article in the literature of a nine-year-old who transmitted to a lot of people. But in general, most people would say that the adolescents, uh, maybe after about 12 years of age, are the patients who typically are most at risk for transmission. Here's another x-ray that shows an enlarged lymph node. Maybe you've noted that uh, several of the x-rays that I've showed you have swollen lymph nodes on the right side, and it turns out that about two-thirds of intrathoracic lymph nodes actually are on the right side with pediatric tuberculosis. In terms of TB treatment, it turns out that pediatric TB treatment is not that different than treatment of adults. I cannot think of a single drug used in an adult that I would not use in a child. The important thing is to use weight-based dosing for children. So all the doses that we would use, we would calculate based on the child's weight. And it's important that you monitor their weight over time, because lots of kids gain a good amount of weight. And especially babies would need to have their doses adjusted even during the course of their treatment. When you see some of the doses, you might think that they're a little bit elevated compared to adults. But it turns out that recent studies have 
shown that the drug metabolism is significantly faster in children, and so they they have higher relative doses compared to adults. But it's also important to note that we would not exceed the adult maximum. The only rare situation there would be in, if you uh, ha were struggling with TB treatment and you were monitoring drug levels, and in that case, you could elevate the drug dose to make sure you're on the right track for your patient. So for pediatric TB, uh, we most commonly use four drug initial therapy, just like for adults. And having said that, you'll see in the national guidelines that some experts would administer three drug treatment using isoniazid, rifampin, and pyrazinamide as the initial regimen. Some people are reluctant to use ethambutol because um, you can't monitor for the visual changes as easily in children as adults. So having said that, there are no well-proven cases of the eye toxicity in children. There is one case that is perhaps a little bit suspicious. But now that we realize that the ethambutol toxicity is very closely related to dose, if we keep the dose less than about 25 milligram per kilogram, we think the risk is exceedingly low. And I personally would never hesitate to use ethambutol for a pediatric patient. So the exceptions to the three drug um, initial regimen would be if your source case has been identified and has known pan-susceptible mycobacterium tuberculosis, of course it's fine to start the child on isoniazid, rifampin, and pyrazinamide. And additionally, some experts believe that if the presumed source case or the child have no risk factors for multidrug, excuse me, for drug-resistant tuberculosis, it's okay to start with three-drug regimen. Again, I personally use four drugs unless I know the source case has pan-susceptible TB. This table shows the recommended um, pediatric TB drug dosing that's published by the American Academy of Pediatrics in their red book. And you'll see that the doses have changed over the last several years because of the newer pharmacokinetic data. And we feel strongly that these doses are appropriate, are safe, and lead to good uh, pharmacokinetic data and outcomes. In terms of treatment regimens in general, we use the same as adults. In the initial regimen for about two months, we use three to four drugs by directly observed therapy. And in the continuation phase, four months of two drugs, isoniazid and rifampin, again, by directly observed therapy. You can use the continuation phase either daily, and usually that means directly observed therapy Monday through Friday. You can use treatment twice weekly or three times weekly. And I have to say that I've had a couple situations recently with adolescents who um, really struggled, and so personally, I am staying away from twice weekly regimens. And I know that there's, there are health departments around the country that, in fact, always use daily treatment. I think that three times weekly is usually appropriate. I think it leads to good drug levels, and I think then even if a child misses a dose here or there, that you wind up with a twice weekly reg regimen, and um, this is going to be usually safe. And I have to say that there are uh, twice weekly and three times weekly regimens that are, have been studied in thousands of children and have led to good outcomes. If your patient is infected with isoniazid monoresistant tuberculosis, then we would treat with rifampin, pyrazinamide, ethambutol for at least six months. Uh, just like an adult, if you had very extensive disease and proven isoniazid monoresistant disease, sometimes we would add a fluoroquinolone. Levofloxacin is the most appealing fluoroquinolone for children because there's extensive safety and pharmacokinetic data, and it's available as a liquid suspension. And then finally, on this slide, there are a lot of children who are at risk for mycobacterium bovis disease, and this is most frequently from infection with unpasteurized milk or cheese in children who live along the U.S.-Mexican border. Mycobacterium bovis is inherently resistant to pyrazinamide, and so we use isoniazid, rifampin, and ethambutol for two months followed by at least seven months, up to 10 months, of isoniazid and rifampin, depending upon the clinical response to treatment. Mycobacterium bovis disease is disproportionately affecting the lymph nodes, both in scrofula and intra-abdominal lymph nodes. And so those diseases tend to have a, a sluggish clinical response. Lymph nodes often get bigger before they get smaller in what we call the paradoxical response or part of the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So sometimes we wind up using a little bit longer treatment for mycobacterium bovis just to be safe until those lymph nodes start to regress well. 
In terms of labs and the use of pyridoxine or vitamin B6, um, there's really only one universal lab that we obtain in, in TB disease in children, and that's the HIV serology. The good news is that HIV is now rare in U.S. children because mothers are screened so well during pregnancy and treated with antiretrovirals if they are infected. So the good news is, is in the United States we have relatively little HIV, but we still recommend testing all individuals with TB disease with uh, HIV serology. Now, other labs would not routinely be collected, even liver function tests. Having said that, if the child is at risk for liver disease, for example, they have underlying liver problems, they take other medicines that are potentially hepatotoxic, then it's appropriate to get baseline labs and consider getting screening labs through the course of treatment. In terms of vitamin B6 or pyridoxine, most children do not need vitamin B6 supplementation. The exception would be children who do not have milk or meat in their diet, or those children who are exclusively breastfeeding, who are HIV infected, or in adolescence, sometimes we add vitamin B6. Having said that, most of the health departments I work with are more comfortable using uh, vitamin B6 for TB disease. And so I offer these doses. If the child is a baby, I suggest a quarter of a 25 milligram tablet. And that can be um, crushed and suspended in a little bit of breast milk, a quarter of a tab for toddlers, and then one tab for school age and older children. In terms of latent TB infection, you know this already. We've reviewed it before. And it is a latent TB infection is defined as a positive tuberculin skin test with no clinical or radiographic findings to suggest disease. There are radiographic findings that are abnormal but do not support the diagnosis of TB disease. And here are the regimens for pre treatment of pediatric latent TB infection. In adults, we sometimes use six months of treatment of isoniazid, but in children, we use nine months of isoniazid, which turns out to be 270 doses. And the uh, Alaskan data around the time that isoniazid was licensed showed us that short gaps in treatment did not negatively impact the efficacy of latent TB infection. And so I tell the kids, I would love for you to take your medicine every single day. You can put a calendar and put stickers or make a mark and keep it up. But if you miss a dose here or there, it is not the end of the world. And you can just come back and see me for longer. If it takes you 10 months or 11 months, that's fine. The basic rule is that we like the kids to get the 270 doses in, which turns out to be nine bottles of 30 pills in a one-year period. Again, six months of isoniazid is not considered an acceptable regimen for children. The next regimen that's appropriate for children is six months of rifampin. And this is in distinction to the adult regimen of four months. Until recently, there was very little data comparing uh, rifampin to isoniazid for the treatment of latent TB infection. But Dr. Menzies in Canada has been studying this extensively. And the data looks very, very impressive for the efficacy of four months of rifampin. And so my prediction is that shortly, the American Academy of Pediatrics and others will endorse four months of rifampin for children. And finally, Isoniazid and rifampin weekly for 12 doses by directly observed therapy is also an acceptable regimen for latent TB infection in children. The MMWR guideline published by CDC has doses for slightly older children, but says clearly that you can use it on a case-by-case -case basis in younger children. And for patients who are at high risk of uh, progression to disease or in situations, for example, when we had a shortage of isoniazid, and when you have the capability to do directly observed therapy, I think this is a great regimen, which is much more conducive to, to adherence and complete, complete, excuse me, completion of the regimen. You see I have a strike through for this final regimen. Uh, at one time, we used rifampin and pyrazinamide for two months for treatment of LTBI based on studies that were initially done in HIV-infected adults with LTBI. Unfortunately, when the regimen was used more widely um, outside that population, there was a significant risk of hepatotoxicity and even some cases of fatal hepatotoxicity. This regimen has never been studied in children and is not recommended for any individuals for LTBI. Having said that, it turns out that if you were to 
evaluate a child for possible tuberculosis, collect cultures, evaluate their household, and start a patient on four drug treatment. After two months of regimen, for some reason, you come to conclude the child does not have tuberculosis disease, they will have been treated successfully for latent TB infection because they will have received two months of rifampin and pyrazinamide. So while we would never use the rifampin and pyrazinamide intentionally as a two-drug regimen for LTBI, again, a four-drug regimen for DB disease that doesn't pan out would actually be considered appropriate treatment and you could be done. All right, so a little, just a little bit more about LTBI treatment. Before we do that, I have to give a shout out to my son, Nicholas Loeffler, who was the actor in this video when he was very young. And if you go online uh, using this link, you can see Nicholas having, being the uh, demonstrator for the gastric aspirate. I'm proud to say that a lot of people have come up to me and told me that this was a very helpful video. And um, of course, we didn't actually put the tube down. We just held it at his nose, but he, he is good at crying. And so it looks very realistic. And I apologize that um, I was not so good about infection control. You would never do a procedure on a patient where you might touch human moisture or butter, blood or body fluids without gloves on. So I apologize for that. And Nicholas is proud that he's positively infected, impacted the uh, public health of the children in the world. OK, so latent TB infection. Again, we talked about this before. Never start LTBI treatment until TB disease is ruled out. This is not always easy to do, but it's the right thing to do. Ideally, if there's any question they have TB disease, you're going to collect cultures. I like to sort of look at the whole status of the household, because if you have other household members who have positive skin tests or, of course, who have TB disease, you're more likely to start a multi-drug regimen if you're uncomfortable waiting. Again, this is the link that tells you um, has some great resources, as well as this video of Nicholas pretending to have a gastric aspirate. And then, as I mentioned before, two months of four drugs is considered treatment for latent TB infection. So in all patients, pediatrics and adults, the adherence to a regimen for latent TB infection is very difficult. So this is a disease condition where patients have no symptoms. And the, there's only a theoretical risk that they will ever have symptoms or ever have a problem. And so you're basically treating them to prevent a future problem. So in order to ensure adherence, the first thing I like to do is treat only those who truly have latent TB infection. So I like to really only test those people who have a high rate, a high positive predictive value of the test. I don't like to test people who are unlikely to have TB infection. And when you are preparing to treat a patient for TB, LTBI, you want to be very compelling. And you want to explain that this has a very high likelihood of killing all the TB germs in their body and preventing a long-term problem. Again, even if you're compelling and even if they truly have LTBI, a lot of families are not going to want to do this. And the best thing ever is if they admit that they're not thrilled about this idea, because then you can talk more about it. And frankly, I like to use a little guilt. I say a little well-placed guilt can be a good thing. And so I emphasize to the family that using this one drug regimen for 270 doses is a nuisance, but it's much easier than a four drug regimen if we wait till the child has TB disease. And if we wait till the child has TB disease, they could have disseminated disease. They could have meningeal disease. They could have disease when they're an adolescent and therefore contagious or when they are in medical school, or when they are a young father and their grandbabies, the parents' grandbabies, could be infected. So I find this to be a very, fairly successful strategy, but you never can know. It's very, very important to set up convenient monitoring and medication delivery systems. So while we don't like to give more than one bottle of medicine at a time and no refills unless the patient has been checked for toxicity, very easy nurse visits and uh, quick uh, pharmacy access are going to increase the likelihood of LTBI adherence. If you look on our website, and again, that same section of pediatric TB, you'll see on the left-hand side a list of options, including resources. And I have a lot of forms for both intake and clinic forms, so a nurse can very quickly rattle through, count the pills, ask the side effects, 
and um, check off the family and call in a refill. Really, this can be done in about five minutes. It does have to include a wait, however, and reinforcing to the family what would be the side effects if they did have hepatotoxicity in, in particular. If you have the resources to do LTBI treatment by directly observed therapy, that increases the adherence and sometimes can be done at school. So some of the things that I like to do in addition, I like to use a sticker and calendar system. Um, I like to either have the family buy or when I can get a supply of kid-friendly calendars and provide stickers. I like to have the kid put a sticker on each day that they take their medicine and find some inexpensive reward or no-cost rewards. For example, some kids like to be rewarded with choosing the family dinner one night or a particular outing to a park or something that they like to do. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be something that costs money. And the other nice thing about the sticker and calendar system is if, if the kid lives in a household where there are different caregivers, it's nice to know on any given day that someone has given the medicine. So if mom comes home late from work, she can see that you know teenage brother gave the patient the medicine and it avoids double dosing. As I mentioned, incentives are good. Whatever your family can come up with or your health department has resources for. And then as I mentioned, the patients, all patients on any kind of LTBI or TB um, treatment need to be closely monitored. I like to suggest at least monthly in person for several months this helps reinforce adherence and screen for side effects because most toxicity is going to happen in the first few months of treatment. And then after that, you could consider phone monitoring. And maybe this is done, every, maybe you see the patient in person every few months and you talk to them on the phone in between. It has to be convenient, it has to be quick, uh, but it does have to be effective in terms of screening for symptoms. So as I mentioned, you definitely want to monitor for weight for a couple of reasons. Usually the weight increases impressively, and sometimes in little kids the doses need to be adjusted. But if the child is failing to gain weight, it's possible that they're having side effects, and the reason is because anorexia is the most early and consistent feature of hepatotoxicity. Additionally, sometimes failure to gain weight is actually an indication that you have not identified TB disease and triggers you to evaluate the child further, perhaps with a repeat chest radiograph or other evaluation. The next thing you want to do is monitor activity, energy, and sleep. Again, these are common features of hepatotoxicity. Anorexia, sluggishness, fatigue, those are indications of perhaps hepatotoxicity. The sort of good news is that um, it's not uncommon that kids with either LTBI or TB disease become much more active because their infection is being treated and sometimes that's actually pretty annoying to the family. They're suddenly eating a lot more and a lot more active, and perhaps this is completely normal for their age, but the family had kind of gotten used to that quiet, quiet, complacent child. Again, toxicity is exceedingly rare in children. I think I've been involved in about 10 cases altogether, including with warm line consultations. But to be safe, you never want to give one, more than one month of meds at a time. Um, but you do not need to check routine liver function tests except in the circumstances where they have underlying liver disease, they take other hepatotoxic meds, they have HIV infection, or the uh, adolescent girls of color. So Hispanic girls, black girls, more likely to have hepatotoxicity. Children, ugh, teenagers who use alcohol, or of course children who have symptoms anorexia, malaise, abdominal pain, vomiting, those are the common symptoms. So if you were to check liver function tests on all children, what you would see is that a good number of them have transient elevation of their transaminases. And I like to concentrate on the ALT because that is the number that is most specific for uh, the liver. And so let's say you're in a situation where you checked an ALT and you found that the um, ALT was elevated. And these are the guidelines. If the child is symptomatic, we tolerate a ALT of up to three times the upper limit of normal. If the child is asymptomatic, they're allowed to have an ALT up to five times the upper limit of normal. And after that, if it gets higher than that, you have to consider the possibility of isoniazid-induced hepatotoxicity or another cause of hepatotoxicity. 
I think it was a study in the 60s that looked at this and found that the vast majority of kids who bumped their transaminases actually had a different problem, such as hepatitis A or EBV disease or another infection that caused elevation of transaminases. It was rarely the isoniazid. But you still have to look. You still have to hold the isoniazid until the number comes down, and then you can carefully re-offer it if, um, if the um, transaminase elevation wasn't too dramatic. As I mentioned, most liver toxicity will happen in the first few months, but I really, really insist that the families can tell me exactly what they're watching for. We are not waiting until the child has jaundice because that is a late finding. And if you wait until the child is jaundiced, it is possible that they will have irreversible toxicity and require liver transplant. So don't wait for that. I try to empower families to stop treatment and seek care if these children have symptoms for three days that is not improving. I ask them to offer their child something delicious that they would always like. And if the child is not interested in even, say, McDonald's french fries after three days of anorexia that's not improving, I tell the family, stop the medicine and we'll check the liver. I, I don't tell the families, or the, the kid anyway, that we're going to be doing a blood test because I worry that that'll send them underground and be, they'll be less likely to tell. In terms of, um, in terms of a, a very common phenomenon, and that is a lot of parents are not thrilled about this treatment. And so sometimes the uh, report of toxicity and side effects, especially if it's rather vague, actually reflects the parent's discomfort. And again, in the ideal world, they'll tell you that so that you can talk about it. And if the side effects seem modest or trivial, of course, they are not to the parent, we can sometimes be creative and use some reassurance. So for example, if they have a nonspecific rash that's not hive-like, you can use a little Benadryl and usually get past most rashes. If the kid has a little bit of stomach upset, you can try dosing at bedtime with a little bit of food. And then if they have a little bit of stomach upset, they can sleep through it. I like to personally avoid the liquid suspension because it contains a lot of sorbitol, which causes diarrhea and abdominal discomfort. Um, in the Babies, sometimes this drug is more often tolerated, but more than half of older kids will not tolerate the liquid suspension. We'll talk about how I use the tablets in a minute. And then finally, sometimes I consider a little brief drug holiday. So sometimes I tell the kids who are, aren't feeling great after taking the medicine for a couple months, well, you know what, let's give your little stomach a break. Let's hold the medicine for a week or two, and then let your stomach sort of get back to normal. Then we'll start it in the evening with some food and usually some creative uh, strategies like that will help. But lots of times, again, if the, the family is reluctant to use the drug, you're going to find more of these reports of side effects. I mentioned already about the isoniazid suspension. Um, I essentially don't use it, but I'm fine using it, especially if, there's a, if it's a baby or if it's an older ch child who tolerates it fine. If a child comes into my care and they're already on isoniazid liquid and it doesn't bother them and their stomach is fine and they don't have diarrhea, fine with me. Now, there are other suspensions, however. So isoniazid is the only one of the first line TB treatments that's available commercially as a suspension. But the pharmacies can crush other pills or open the rifampin capsules or even the isoniazid, and they can put them into what they call simple syrup. Sometimes they add a flavor shot. And the problem with these medicines is that they do not have a well-documented stability or homogeneity. So for kids who like to take their medicine in a sugary liquid like that, what I suggest is that the family just use a, a tablet or a fraction of a tablet and that they, they suspend it right just before they give it, just that one dose, and then they give it to the kid. But I do want to point out that isoniazid breaks down in sugary liquid, and it breaks down in one of the components is hydrazine, which is, doesn't kill mycobacterium tuberculosis, but is a component of rocket fuel. So as long as we're dealing with kids and not rockets, let's not put the isoniazid into this simple syrup, especially if it's going to sit around for any length of time. Again, if you, um, if you want to put the isoniazid into something, you have to give it just after you suspend it. If it sits there, it will break down. All right, medication delivery is probably the hardest thing about pediatric TB treatment, and every single child is different and every single child and parent dynamic is different. 
and a trick that worked in one kid might work for a week and then stop working or may never work at all. So I basically like to empower the family and the public health team to find the best delivery system for that child and at that time. What I find is sometimes that means that the family um, has to take charge, and if that's the case, they need to be very definitive about it, sort of no nonsense, this is what we're doing. If the kid gets the sense that there's some possibility that a certain amount of fussing and kicking and screaming and objecting and bad behavior will let them off or get a nicer attention from their parents um, or prizes or anything else, that is likely to backfire. Sometimes it means that the public health department can take the lead and the parents can sort of be in the background. Because as we all know, not uncommonly, kids, at least in the short run, sometimes give strangers better behavior than they give us. And I'm talking about my own kids here. So um, if I'm treating a child for tuberculosis, the first thing I like to consider is whether I can teach the older child how to take the pills whole. Or if not, then I like to break up the pill into fractions. And what I find is that if you don't crush the tablet for those older children who could potentially swallow the medicine maybe in a little bit of a vehicle, it doesn't taste so bad. Once you crush up those tablets, they're pretty strong flavored and they're not too tasty. Um, I have a couple of teens lately who have really become anxious with treatment, especially multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, and this has led to a very challenging two years of treatment, both for the child, the family, the public health department, and yes, even me sitting here in my office um, feeling concerned about my patients. So I think in the future I might try anxiolytics a little earlier or talk to an adult clinician in MDR-TB sooner because I think that, um, that the adults commonly um, suffer from some of these problems. So this is my sandwich technique. Um, this is not patented, and I did not, and I did not um, uh, think of it myself. A family taught it to me, and the idea is that you take a spoon, you put a layer of something soft and yummy on the bottom of the spoon, you put the fragments of the pills or the powder from the pills or the capsules and put that on the soft vehicle, and then you put another layer of the yummy stuff on top. Additionally, if you give something tasty first, like some of this food, perhaps it's going to be some jelly, perhaps it's going to be a little maple syrup, kind of fills up their taste buds first before you give the medicine. Or some kids like a popsicle because the cold, um, the coldness in the mouth kind of dulls down their, their taste buds a little bit. Then you have them take the spoon, which has the medicine, and then follow it with a spoon of the yummy stuff. Of course, this all works better if the child is hungry. It also works the best if you can find a vehicle that the child can swallow down without mushing it around in their mouth or without chewing it. So some people swear by Hershey's chocolate ice cream topping. I personally have recommended Nutella to a lot of families. Baby foods work well in young kids. Some kids don't like um, sweet things. So I've heard of kids taking it in chili. And the family who taught it to me uh, used chocolate whipped cream. Apparently Ready Whip has a chocolate product. D who knew? But any system that you try in a child might work for a few weeks, and then you have to try something different. Either it's a different vehicle, either it's fragment, or there's little cups that teach kids to swallow the, the tablets whole. Just do not become frustrated and realize that a missed dose here or there is not the end of the world. You have to get on back on track and you have to figure out how to engage the child so that this doesn't become a day-to-day -day battle. So that is the end of my talk for today, and I wanted to point out some of these children. This is the um, picture in the Ethiopian adoptee of my little patient who I showed you in the swing in the beginning who had multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Uh, this is her as an older child. She, she's even older now, and she's just as cute as she can be. This is uh, my son, Nicholas, who you can see tolerated and uh, survived his gastric asper procedure and his uh, third grade basketball. Here he is um, at Mount Bachelor in, in Oregon, where we live now. And uh, this is my oldest son, Michael, who is jumping at historic Hayward Field. If you're a, if you're a track and field aficionado, you know Hayward Field is the home of the NCAA 
championships often and the U.S. Olympic trials, and Michael is clearing the bar to be the uh, fourth place as a sophomore. So he's expecting better things this year. So I thank you so much for your care of the children. I thank you for your time today, and I'm glad to entertain questions by email through the National Tuberculosis Warm Line, and uh, appreciate you letting me be involved in the care of your patients. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Loeffler. And uh, if you have any questions, here is our contact information. We'd also enjoy connecting with you on social media. And that concludes this training.